this morning I, I've been wrestling over this message that's been brewing inside of me for a little while. And um, I, I've come to what I believe God would have the people of Hillside Community Church and whoever's listening, whether you're uh, listening online or wherever you are, I believe this morning's message is timely and it's deep. So I need you to, to follow along with me. It, it, we're going to be going through a lot of different scriptures today. And um, it, it's, a, it's a deep message, and it's, it's very meaty in its, uh, in its content. And there's a lot of indirect inferences to uh, things that you're going to see as we go through it. My message uh, today is uh, keeping God's perspective in the gray areas. And um, I'm going to have two portions of Scripture that are my primary text, but we'll be moving throughout different Scriptures in this message. And my two uh, texts are Acts chapter 15. You'll find uh, different verses in that will be my text, along with 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Would you bow with me in prayer before we start this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we know that you speak the truth in your word. And you speak the truth, God, into every circumstance of our lives and every season of our lives. So, God, as I I give this message, I just pray, Lord, that what your will is, that it would be accomplished and that our hearts would be open and that you would speak to us individually, that you would speak to us corporately, that you would strengthen us and nourish us, nourish us, Lord, in your your spirit and through your, your, your divine word, O God in the text that we have today. Help me to explain it in a way that's honoring to you, in which you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the early church, many people from all sorts of different backgrounds, both Jews and Gentiles, were coming to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And as you can imagine, Because of the variety of cultures and backgrounds blending together in the church, there were many differences between the believers in their preferences and opinions on a wide variety of topics. Now, for some people, these preferences were becoming regarded by them personally as doctrines. And as such, they began to take their preferences to being more than preference, but being the very word of God. And they began to drift towards criticism of others whose preferences were different than their own. And they began to treat gray issues as though they were black and white issues. This we see in the text throughout the New Testament. This um, created divisions in the church that needed to be diffused. And today, in a similar fashion, there are numerous issues that we face on a day-to-day basis that may stir our emotions very deeply. And they stir our emotions either positively or negatively. And many of those feelings differ from person to person. And as a result, people with the same core doctrinal beliefs in the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ develop opinions or preferences, what I like to call dogmas. And like the early church, there is a grave danger where our personal dogmas can become entrenched to the point where people begin to put dogmas on par with the weight of biblical doctrine. And today I would like to address this subject. And as a background to this message, it may may be helpful for us to understand the issues the Bible tells us that the early churches were facing. By reading scripture, we can see that the early Christians we're dealing with significant issues of contention 
in both the Jewish and the Gentile congregations. And many of the church, let's, let's talk about the Jewish congregations first. Many of the church congregations established near the land of Israel were composed uh, or, or comprised of largely Jewish converts. Because they were coming to Christ out of a Jewish community and a Jewish culture, they were familiar with this culture that strictly followed the laws of Moses. And some had an extremely hard time when they came to faith in Jesus Christ. They had an extremely hard time of letting go of what they had formerly followed at, you know, verbatim in the law of Moses. Even though they were coming to Jesus and experiencing the freeing grace of the Lord, they found comfort in the familiarity of their former culture. Now, most human beings, you and I are not exempt from this. We like a comfortable routine because it's familiar territory. And, and when we have familiar territory and we're fitting into familiar territory, we have a sense of somewhat of a control over the outcomes of the circumstances that surround us. And this is why most of us gravitate to sitting in the same chair all the time at home or at church. It's human nature. There's a sense of comfort and protection in the stability of a context of what we know. So, you know, I, I look here and most everyone's sitting in, in similar places that they were the week before, the week before that. Some people are changed. Some people are in different places. But, <coughs> pardon me, as a, as a general rule, this is human nature. So certain believers in the early church that were uh, coming to faith in Christ through Jewish sensitivities had a conscience to certain points of the law of Moses that they wished to carry with them into their Christian faith as personal preferences or dogmas. And certain Jewish converts to Christianity felt so strongly in their convictions that they wanted to follow certain regulations and keep certain regulations in the law of Moses to become a requirement. They, they, they felt so deeply about these things that they, wanted, they, they felt that they were a requirement for salvation. They wanted their preferences to be turned into doctrines. And they wanted this to be forced upon the Gentile believers who did not come from their frame of reference. And some of those who had been converted from certain sects of Judaism, for instance, the sect of the Pharisees, they wanted the Gentile believers to be circumcised in accordance with the law of Moses because their conscience said that that's what the people of God had to do. It was an absolutely huge issue in the early church, and it included all of the leadership in both the Gentile and the Jewish churches, and they had to deal with it. It caused a great deal of division and turmoil. It led to sharp conflicts in the ranks of the people of God. We find the story of this turmoil in Acts chapter 15. In verses 1 and 2, just kind of as a snapshot of what was happening, Acts 15, 1 and 2 reads this. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. Judea was the Jewish center, and Antioch was in the Gentile world. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom, notice the word custom, taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This debate brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. So in 15, I'm not going to go through the entire chapter because I've got too many places that I need to visit this morning. But if you go through the chapter and you read further, this issue gets resolved. After all was said and done, the idea to saddle the Gentile believers with compl complying with the ceremonial law of circumcision 
according to the law of Moses, was rejected. It was rejected. All of the apostles and elders of the church in Jerusalem came to a decision, and we jump down Acts 15 into verses 24 to 29. Okay? After the decision was made, they told the Gentile churches this, we have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and distur- disturbed you. Troubling. Sorry. For some reason, page 11 of my notes is in page 4. Okay. Let's start over. Verse 24. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Hmm. Well, when I read this passage of Scripture, I must admit, when I read that, my immediate thought was this. Hey, wait a minute. The council in Jerusalem just finished condemning legalism by making a decision not to ask the Gentiles to undergo circumcision. So why are they tagging the Gentile churches with a requirement to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals? Now, I mean, regarding sexual immorality, it's a moral issue, yes, for sure. And I can understand it because it's a moral law of God. But the rest of it sounds an awful lot like the same legalism that they decided not to saddle on the churches under the law of Moses. So, eh. while pondering this, I thought about another scripture that was written to the church in Corinth by the Apostle Paul and, and how his instructions to them seem to contradict some of what we're reading here in Acts 15. Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So let's move over to there. Now Paul's talking to the Gentile church, and this is what he says, starting with verse 1. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no one but God. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificed food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. So, when I looked at 15 in Acts chapter 15 and and 1 Corinthians chapter 8, And I pondered these scriptures, a light turned on. You see, this order of the apostles and the elders of the Jewish church addressed to the Gentiles in Acts 15 had nothing to do with legalism under the law. When you think about the cultural settings that the Gentiles would have been living in prior to embracing Christianity, it all makes perfect sense. 
You see, although the, the law of Moses forbade the eating of meat with blood still in it, the decree given by the apostles and the elders of the church in Jerusalem, in this case, had nothing to do with that, I don't think. It was, it was in fact, altogether given to encourage the Gentile believers to abandon selfishness and to act out of love for the benefit of their brothers and sisters whose consciences might be defiled. Consider the idol worship in the ancient setting. In idol worship, people would bring animals to the temple of their choice. The blood would be spilled on the temple altars and the meat from the sacrifice. Idols would be sold in the markets to support the priests and the priestesses. Gentile children would have been steeped in idol worship and, and um, the ceremonies surrounding those sacrifices that were taking place. And to many, many people who were escaping these traditions and being freed from the pagan rituals turning to Jesus, the thought of participating in anything associated to the ceremonies which formerly bound them was personally abhorrent. In addition to this, in the communities where the gospel was being preached, there were many Jewish people from Jewish customs who did not have faith in Jesus Christ yet. And many of these people held very strictly to the law of Moses. And in the law, it was strictly forbidden to eat meat with blood still in it or blood products of any kind. You wouldn't find blood sausage on a Jewish menu. In Leviticus chapter 17, 13 and 14, it was written by Moses. Any Israelite or foreigner residing among you who hunts any animal or bird that may be eaten must drain the blood of, of it and cover it with earth because the very life of every creature is in its blood. That is why I have said to the Israelites, you must not eat the blood of any creature because the life of every creature is in its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. Pretty strong words in the law of Moses. And as a Christian Jew set free from the law of Moses, to suddenly disregard that which had been trained into you from generations of culture, you have to realize it would cause a sharp offense with those in the culture who had not yet discovered the freedom of the gospel is a very visible thing. Therefore, to openly practice your freedom to eat whatever you wished in front of them would cause an affront to the gospel. And this is why Paul said this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 20 to 21, he said this, very important. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though, that, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not freed from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Is Paul being wish-washy here because he's shifting his emphasis on dogmas? If you look at the dogmas as doctrine, Paul is contradicting himself. But if you look at this in a mature Christian view the way God intends, there is a principle here that is very relevant for us today and the church throughout history. Now, think about this. In the Gentile communities in Asia Minor and in Rome, people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ from pagan backgrounds. They were worshiping idols before they came to Christ in the great Greco-Roman pantheon, right? All those gods that were, had temples all over the place. They, they, they were part of that. And they were being delivered from the bondage of these demonic religions, understanding that the meat that they were buying that was for sale in the marketplaces had come from these rituals. Their conscience wouldn't allow them to eat it. But there were some whose consciences did not tell them that eating that meat from the marketplace was wrong, regardless of its source, because they believed it was just a piece of meat. And something that when you eat it, it just becomes 
nourishment for your body, and the spiritual aspect is nothing because these so-called gods are not. They're nothing. The variety of opinions about such things as this became points of contention in the early church. This is why Paul is addressing the Corinthians. And just as today, there are opinions about things related to conscience that have also become points of contention in today's church. I want you to know, however, despite the variety of personal opinions on the issue in Paul's day, the Apostle Paul addressed this issue head on. He spoke to this issue of holding dogmas and what you do with your personal convictions and your beliefs, how you handle yourself in public settings. Very important for us today. The same principles can be applied. So Paul continues to instruct his fellow believers in Corinth, saying, in, we'll continue in 1 Corinthians 8, with verse 9. He says, Despite the believer's right to exercise personal convictions, he says this, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all of your knowledge, eating at an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weaker brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I won't cause them to fall. Wow. Pretty strong words for personal conviction dogmas. What Paul says here is not just about meat sacrificed to idols, my friends. This is the example of how he dealt with that issue. But this can be applied to anything that is what we call a gray issue or a matter of, matter of personal preference or dogma where strong opinions are held based upon convictions. For example, the preference is we have chosen by our own conscience. And I'm going to talk about this as a dogma. Whether we are to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. If we abide by the scriptural principle given by Paul, we might find ourselves saying something like this. Self, I will never raise I will never raise a contentious discussion with someone who has a conscience one way or another in this gray area unless we mutually agree to discuss it on an open-ended plane. Self, if I stand on my dogma and I push my thoughts and feelings on a gray area like this, and I cause my brother or sister to fall into sin against Christ because their, their conscience is violated. I am doing wrong. I love my brethren too much to do this to them. As such, I will hold to my personal convictions before God. I will not allow my personal convictions before God to be spoken of as evil, but I will be humble and open to God to show me where I need to change or where I need to continue to hold and avoid this subject that brings division in the body of Christ with the people Jesus has died for and has brought us together with. I need self. 
to be respectful of the others who have different backgrounds to what they think than my own and have different convictions on the matter. Further to this, my, my brothers and sisters, in 1 Corinthians, I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to you. There is more that emphasizes what I'm saying. Paul tells the Romans in the Roman church, in Romans chapter 14, 13 to 21, this is what he says. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know to be good is spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Therefore, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink or wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Yes, this is a very distinct example of meat sacrificed to idols and meat strangled that had blood in it still. Very specific example, but the principles. You see, whatever our conscience tells us about the safety of what is good or not good to put into our bodies, based upon our own research into the subject, okay? It's not a matter of black and white morality. This is not a doctrine. It is a dogma. It is a personal conviction. It is a belief that we've developed because of our circumstances and our background. We must remember, not everyone will have the same opinion as we have regarding that issue. When you know that you're in the same place as someone and it becomes apparent that they don't hold the same opinion or preference that you do on an issue, don't force feed them your opinion. We must make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of your own opinion about an injection. This is why we must be careful how we interact with others in public arenas. And in social media platforms, we must be careful. When the Council of Jerusalem made their edict about meat sacrifice to idols, they were dealing with an issue that was offensive to Gentile believers coming out of idolatry. That's why they said don't eat. Not because of legalism. Not because they were returning to the law of Moses. They were giving this, reg this recommendation for them because of love. Because in the public setting, they couldn't eat that meat without wounding someone's weak conscience. They recommended for the sake of unity not to eat. And they were dealing also with this conscience of the Jews who were coming out of Judaism and were not able in good conscience to eat meat with blood in it. It was an issue of conscience because of their cultural upbringing with the law of Moses. So for the sake of the love of others, they were recommending the believers abstain from this practice. And also, they recommended no sexual immorality, which doesn't cross the borders of conscience, but is a direct command of God and is a doctrinal issue. But those were the issues facing that church, so they brought it up and they sent it to them in this letter. There was problems with these things, and there's problems with the issue of sexual immorality, much the same as there's a problem with sexual immorality in our society, and it needs to be addressed. The body was not made for sexual immorality. Sexual contact with 
anyone but a spouse under the bond of marriage is a sin before God, and God doesn't want us to suffer the consequences of bridging that. Just to make that clear. But in the gray areas, you know, there are hills to die on, and the gray areas are not those hills to die on. There's close-handed principles of doctrine such as our salvation in Christ and faith and, and salvation by grace through, through faith in Christ. Th- those kind of issues are, are non-negotiables. They are they're close-handed. But they're open-handed issues that are not matters of life or death, I guess. Well, they may be, you know, if you're wrong in your conscience... They may, but that's not for us. That is for that person between them and God to decide. Gray areas of opinion. There's going to be someone who's right and there's going to be someone who's wrong, even in the gray areas. Those who are right will, in the end, reap certain benefits and those who are wrong will have certain consequences. But that's not... We don't judge our brothers and sisters. This is between them and God. We love them. And we respect their conscience. And we respect the fact that they have come out of a certain cultural context where their conscience is sensitive. So, how do we do this? You know, If my brother in Christ has a problem with idol meat, I'm not going to have him over for dinner and say, guess what we're having tonight? We're having idol meat. And there's nothing wrong with it. Can't you see this, you dummy? Can't you see this, you, you moron? Look at all the research. It's just meat. We're not going to do that, are we, if we love our brother? We might have free-range chickens at our home. And we say, yeah, this is a meal that uh, we prepared from our own from our own hand on the farm that we have here. We, we'd like to bless you with it and have you over for dinner. Right? Yeah, hey, I'm by myself and I'm having this steak and I'm good with it. Have your steak. But don't, for the sake of food or for the sake of any issue, cause your brother and sister to stumble. It's important for us to know this. God knows the truth and all things will be revealed in his time. And what's important for us is to be committed to our lives in sync with the spirit. And the rule of thumb is this. It's this. That everything we do, everything, not just some things, absolutely everything we do as believers must be done out of true love for God and true love for our fellow men. That's the law we live under in grace. Everything we do, we do is unto the Lord. And we do for the benefit of others. Selfishness goes out the window when you become a believer. What about my rights? You don't have any rights as a believer anymore. You're not your own. You're purchased with a price. You belong to Jesus. And your life is a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever you go whether it's in a Christian setting or a non-Christian setting, you are not your own. You are the Lord's. And everything you do must be done done out of love for him and love for the people that you're with. That is being a true Christian. That is Christianity 101. And sometimes I think we need to get back to that. And we need to repent in ways that we've drifted from that. In camping on personal preferences or dogmas and treating them like a doctrine has the potential to lead us into the sin of pride and the idolization of human leaders in our favorite camps who are most ably articulating our preferences, losing our bearings with the principles of the scripture. They have this, they have this nasty thing associated to them. They create divisions in the church which ultimately ultimately damage the church in presenting the gospel to a world that is going to hell in a handbasket. They need Jesus. 
The people out there in darkness need to see the light shining from this church and from the people because you are the church. What you say online, what you say downtown, what you say to your neighbors, what you say is the fact of the matter. You are the church, and what you say speaks for the church. Because you are the church. Church isn't just here. It's not a building. It's not, it is an institution. Yes, it is, but it's made up of people. And you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Therefore, honor the Lord with the person that you are because it does make a difference. To cap this thought, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 22 to 24. And what does he say? He says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So together, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. In concluding, with any of these preferences that we hold to in the gray areas of life in our opinions, we need to carefully ask ourselves a number of questions. I heard this And I I really think we need to to think about this. Think deeply about this. Does the Bible allow it? Does the Bible allow it? If the answer is no, we must be willing to change our viewpoint. If the answer is yes, then the second question we must ask on the heels of that is, does my conscience allow it? If the answer is no, then we must hold our conviction Unless the Lord changes us. Unless the Lord shows us that our conviction is wrong. If my conscience does allow it, then I must ask, what is the effect of what I am doing promoting or holding to have on the non-Christians? I need to ask that question. I must ask this question because the gospel is more important than my rights. And finally, the question I must ask is, what is the effect of what I am doing, promoting, or holding to having on my personal spiritual life? I must ask this question because my spiritual health is more important than my freedom. And I didn't mention what is the effect that I am of of what I am doing, promoting, or holding to having on Christians, my fellow believers in Christ. I must ask this question because love is more important than knowledge. Love precedes knowledge in Christ. Yes, God wants us to be knowledgeable, but it must be tapered through the lens of love. It must be approached through the lens of love. So through the writing of scriptures, the the apostles have urged us not to place an undue emphasis on non-essentials. In every group of people, one person will view something one way and another person will view something another way. It's not to say someone is right and another person is wrong, but if we have a differing view on an essential with someone else or a non-essential with someone else, I should say. If we have a differing view on a non-essential with someone else, we need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer. Prayer, firstly, that all parties involved, including ourselves, might be rightly aligned with the truth. And secondly, that God would help us to find ways to love our brethren in practical ways. This might mean deciding not to visit the contentious subject with them. Preserving unity in the body of Christ, it's not a trivial matter, my friends. The Bible talks an awful lot about how we need to be unified and how division 
is actually abhorrent to the Lord. You know, there's points that we are divided about concerning doctrine that is immovable. What I'm talking about here is personal preferences, dogmas. You know, we need to be humble. We need to be humble. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray that our hearts would be rent before God, rent before God so that in the areas where we're not right, we get a change of heart. Who here is fully mature in the Lord and doesn't need to learn? You know, sometimes we act as though we've got it all, that we understand everything with perfect clarity and we know it all. We don't, people. There's not a day that goes by that we can't learn something new and surrender something new to God. He is the Lord, and we are not. We need to be humble and teachable in our spirit, willing to admit sometimes maybe we're wrong. All of us. There's no no one exempt from this. God is calling us to show love and grace to our brothers or sisters in matter of preference, matters of opinion, matters of dogma. And we have much room for spiritual growth and maturing on this level. We must be on guard to preserve love and unity in the body of Christ. We must be willing to defend each other and stand up for one another. This is why gossip is so horrible. It's devouring. It's evil. And we cannot accept this as something that, sh- that is a lesser thing, a lesser sin, because sometimes it has been that way in the churches where biting and devouring one another ends up in the destruction of the body of Christ for whom Jesus died, and it's unacceptable and it has to stop. If you find yourself struggling with the desire to talk about other people behind their backs, stop it. In the name of Jesus, stop it. We have a mission, and our mission needs to be focused on what is important. And what is important is the fact that Jesus has called us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every living creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we have to be on point with mission. All the gray areas and all the conflicts that are happening need to be thrown away. And we need to come back to the essentials. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says this. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. And in 1 Corinthians 1.10, the Apostle Paul appeals, saying, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. Amen.